Welcome. Chances are you've heard the word tensor, or tensor product, or maybe both. You may be confused about why there are two names, maybe you think of them as the same, and they are relatable, but they do play substantially different roles. And the one difficulty with the tensor product is that it tends to be introduced in the language of pretty sophisticated algebra, and it can be difficult to know how to use that. But behind all that sophistication is something rather transparent and important. That is matrix multiplication. And we're going to start from there and develop the main principles of tensor products and add the ingredients as we need them. So let's begin with the following general rule of thumb. Everything that's described as a tensor is also a multiplication. This we'll see in other lectures. The main idea is any kind of table can be the multiplication. If we have a table full of numbers, then it tells us how the rows, which might be numbered, multiply with the columns to produce a new number. It's a multiplication table. Higher dimensional grids become more convoluted types of multiplication. In that view, then the tensor product deserves to be called a tensor as well. It is a multiplication after all. And in fact, I'm going to claim it's simply matrix multiplication. So let's see how that actually works. If you need to, take some time now to review the notation that we're using for vectors, matrices, and what we call hypermatrices, higher dimensional grids. These are the standard notations where we use subscripts. From this point, we can look at the most basic form of a tensor product. This is when I think of the vector spaces k to the a and k to the b, mapping into matrices that are a by b matrices. I'll be using k to the a times b for that notation. Notice that I have here is a grid, simply with rows and columns. The first component I turn into a column, and the second component I left as a row, and then I fill the grid up with the coordinate-wise product, each one done independently. This is nothing more than column times a row vector. This is, in fact, often called an outer product because it mimics the nature of inner products but in reverse. It's also just a form of matrix products. That turns out to be the tensor product, and anything more sophisticated will, it turns out, be exactly the same thing with small variations. So let's see what those variations are. First, we need a few things to keep track of. Notice that we put the circle times inside. It's a notation that's infix, similar to plus and multiplication, but it's still a function that takes in two inputs and gives us one output. But we make a deviation from the standard notation in the following way. When we write k to the a circle times, or tensor, k to the b, we don't mean the image of this function. Instead, we mean the smallest subspace containing the image, the span of the image. This is important because we want to do linear algebra, and the space that comes back from this function just happens not to be a subspace. It's got a few vectors in there, but they add up to many, many more vectors. And therefore, in general, the space thought of as k to the a tensor k to the b, which is all a by b matrices, is much, much larger than what we can reach with an individual tensor product. We'll get into that later. But first we want to answer why are we even interested in the circle times? Certainly your experience with matrices has led you to believe those are important, so perhaps that's enough. The fact that matrices are important, their products must be important too. But there's something more substantial than that that we should get at, and we can get at with a simple example, the complex numbers as a real vector space. The complex numbers as a real vector space, or if you like, imagine any other product quaternions multiplying together, modules, if you know what those are, whatever complex structure you have, complicated structure you have, you could reduce it to a product that's distributive, with maybe some scalars moving in and out. Let's think of the complex numbers with the real numbers allowed to move in and out, and everything else is just the distributive law. And we know what the product is, we're quite familiar from all our education and algebra classes. A plus BI times C plus DI relates to AC minus BD plus AD plus BCI. Now that's written in the coordinates that we prefer for the complex numbers, but what does that really mean? If we bother to translate these into pairs, as in drawing them on the XY plane, then we think of this product as simply manipulating these two vectors, AB and CD, in the following format. I've used matrix multiplication to demonstrate it. Notice that the first coordinate could be thought of as taking the first row vector times a 2 by 2 matrix times a column vector, producing a 1 by 1 matrix. 
But having put that square matrix in the middle lets us see the dynamics of how we relate them to each other. In the second coordinate, we get a different matrix. These two matrices describe the product in its entirety. This is the first step to understanding what is happening between tensor products and general products. What we've just seen is that describing the product over the reals and the fixed basis 1, i could be describing just or could be done by just describing these two matrices. But this pair turns out to just have been an artifact of choosing 1 and i. We could have used a different basis for the complex numbers. In fact, because our situation involves three vector spaces, one here, here, and here, we could choose our bases completely independently and describe this product in a much more unhelpful way. The first one might be 3, comma, negative i. Those are linearly independent vectors. One's down in the negative y direction, the other one's over three positions on the x-axis. That's not a standard generating set for the complex numbers, but it still generates. So does 2, comma, 1 plus i. And we could keep 1 plus i for this outside. Having assigned these three different bases and applying the product, we see that the matrices that would arise are different. For example, we get a 6 here because 3 multiplies by 2. We get a 3 here for a more complex interaction. This is 3 times 1 plus i. So we get a 3 in the 1 position, and we get a 3i in the second matrix. Multiplying out the rest gives you these formulas. Now, keeping in mind that this is just an example to illustrate, you can change this to other values and see that you get several pairs of matrices that all seem to capture the concept of multiplication of complex numbers, but by seemingly different pairs of matrices. The problem is a lack of uniqueness. So while this has happened in a very natural way, we seem to be lost at what we really want to do with these pairs. They're not unique, and therefore, we can't use them directly in any predictable way. However, we do have some tools. Whenever something's non-unique, chances are very high that there's an equivalence relation that would form the unique structure, especially if the thing that we're building that's non-unique came from a canonical process. All we did was fix a basis for three vector spaces and follow the multiplication rule. So there must be an equivalence between these pairs of matrices. Now, there's a property that we should always remember in algebra. Whenever there's an equivalence, that is exactly the same observation as providing a partition. And a partition is the same as providing a function. Remember, the equivalence classes form the partition parts. From a partition, we get a function by simply taking every element in the set to determine the equivalence class. And once we have a function, we also get an equivalence back. These are interchangeable concepts. You should see the attached lectures if you want to see more on this. Now let's narrow the scope. We're interested not in any set, but in linear algebra type sets. So we have the power of what's known as the fundamental homomorphism theorem. But you can know this from just linear algebra terms as well. What we need is that we no longer care about arbitrary equivalence relations, we only care about those equivalences that respect the linear algebra. That means we could add on both sides and could rescale on both sides. It turns out the rescaling is a consequence of the addition, so it's enough to simply say this is translation invariant. Once we can add to both sides, translate without affecting the equivalence, that type of equivalence is about linear algebra. The second step we learn in linear algebra is that when you create the right type of quotients, the partitions, that break up a space, they all have to be linear subspaces. And they shouldn't intersect if they're a partition, which means linear subsets that are parallel to each other. The parallel axiom is about non-intersection. So equivalence classes, or partitions, that involve linear algebra will always just be parallel subsets to some subspace. That's known as a quotient in general algebra. And that turns out to be equivalent then to a linear map the kernel of the linear map will be the subspace, and all the different heterogeneous solutions will be the various parallel classes. Remember, all of this relates back to simply writing down a matrix if you wish. You can have a matrix that row reduces into some rank form. That changes the basis around, but the kernel, the null space, stays the same regardless of the basis, and the parallel classes remain the same, again, regardless of the basis. This is going to solve our problem of the lack of uniqueness between our pairs. We just need an equivalence relation that's linear, that is, a linear map. Let's see how that actually works out then. Our products are non-unique, but we expect an equivalence to solve the uniqueness. We're going to translate 
from the translation invariant equivalence to a linear map. So what we are looking for in the end is that we have pairs of matrices represented by R2, the pairing. But what we're trying to start from is tensor products, meaning matrix multiplication. So we have our original space M2, meaning two by two matrices, and the space that's representing our complex numbers, and our equivalence is a linear map from one to the other. That should describe the multiplication in C completely. Let's see how exactly that works out. What we need is a function L that takes the tensor product of the first vector and the second vector, which becomes a matrix, and completes that, uh, converts that four by, or two by two matrix into whatever this product equals, which we already know the formula for. Now, why did we expect this to happen? Or should we have? Let's take a look at the multiplication table of the tensor product. All tensors are multiplications. The tensor product is a multiplication as well. Now, we have a natural notation for this. Whenever we want to think of the coordinates as our vector spaces, we can simply fill in all the values as zero and put one in one position. We'll call that E1 if it's in the first position, E2 in the second position, and so forth. If we have a matrix, we could fill the whole grid with zeros, and then in position ij, put a one, and that will be our ej matrix. These are standard basis vectors. There are other bases, but these are the helpful ones to get started in a simple combinatorial way. Notice that this is two by two and has four completely independent pro uh, products. E11 is a completely different matrix than E22. They're linearly independent. In fact, all four of these are linearly independent. Because these are independent, we have all the flexibility we want to impose relations, that is, translation invariant equivalences. And we see that's exactly what happened when we were studying this complex number multiplication. Having settled on the standard uh, basis, one and i, one and i, the multiplication looked like this. In that format, these relations sing to us. E11 has to be made the negative of E22. So E11 will be equal to negative E22. Or if you want to write this in a different notation, you could say E11 plus E22 is equal to zero. Likewise, E12, which is presently independent from E21, needs to become dependent and equal because that's what it is in this multiplication. So our second term is that E12 and E21 must be made equal. What we're really telling you is that this, if we wrote this as a vector, E11 plus E22 and E12 plus or minus E21 are both in the null space of the linear map that takes us from matrix multiplication to complex numbers. It's clear now why this worked for the complex numbers. It hopefully is also something you believe will work in general. Fill out a very large table, possibly with even unequal sides, n by n. All the values in matrix multiplication will be independent everywhere in this particular grid. These are all independent vectors because they're matrices that are filled in in independent positions. Any other product between an m-dimensional space and an n-dimensional space, which is distributive and commutes with the scalars, meaning we have linear algebra, will therefore be something we could relate to this general product. We simply have to add in the relations that tell us where our new product is making some identifications, where have two vectors have a product that happen to be equal, which wouldn't have to have been equal. Up to an equivalence, this is now describing every single multiplication. And we capture that with the following theorem. This is sometimes known with the name of the universal mapping property of a tensor product. That's a lot to remember. We'll sneak up on it instead. For now, I just want you to think of the previous slide. If we write down an independent multiplication table, then any other multiplication table is the same multiplication up to some equivalences between the terms in the table. And we can capture equivalences by linear algebra, a linear map. If I have any distributive product from Ka, Kb, into Kc that commutes with our scalars, there's a unique linear function that takes our multiplication table of matrices to the individual output of our product. The result is that this linear map captures everything that our original product could do. Said another way, linear is just code word for translation invariant equivalence. So the corollary of the universal mapping property of tensors is simply saying this. Every distributive product is a matrix product, just subject to some equivalence relation.
Now digesting that for a program is an enormously helpful tool. Now that we know that all products can be backed up by matrix multiplication, we can write some really stunning software to do quick matrix multiplication and store it efficiently. And in the background, we're capturing every single product by a consequence. All we need is a fast multiplication of matrices and a fast linear map function. Together, we capture everything. But it's not just the efficiency that we capture. We now have a mental model that limits what can actually happen with products. Instead of products being completely unbounded, we realize now we simply have A by B matrices and linear maps out of them. There's a limited number of quantity of those. That means that whatever matrices or whatever products are doing, they're also bound by those rules. And there's enormous pet value in making that simple observation that everything backs up to matrix multiplication. Rewind to the very beginning. All tensors are multiplications. Therefore, all tensors are coming to us from matrix multiplication subject to some equivalence. We'll see how to make this in larger scale, but if you can conceptualize that, that's the connection between tensor products and tensors. Tensors are arbitrary multiplications. Tensor products are the universal ones. Take care.